Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. Luke 1 verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John." And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless." So it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. There is a um, toddler church that's been offered as well, so if if anybody would like to to use that, um, Abby is, is going over to minister to the children. Okay, so last week we began um, a study of the gospel according to Luke. And Luke tells us right off the bat um, in the first four verses why he actually wrote this. You know, we don't have to wonder, so why did Luke write this? He tells us right off the bat, he wrote it in order to write an orderly account of the life of Christ. There were other accounts that were, were being distributed, um, but Luke said that since he had researched all this, he felt that it was wise for there to be an orderly account that was written. But he was going to write this orderly, orderly account in order that people would have assurance regarding the apostolic testimony which they had heard. And so specifically, he's given that to a man named Theophilus. Okay? Now, whether that's his real name or a, a fake name, it doesn't really matter. The point is, the name means a friend of God, right? And so he's writing to this to you, friend of God, in order that you might know that the things which you've heard about Jesus the Messiah are true, are factual, that you can take them to the bank. And so as we study then Luke's account, we have this orderly, if you would, account. So a lot of people wonder, so, you know, there's 
this one says it here, this one says it's there. How do you know? In my mind, none of the others state that. Luke is letting me know that he's doing a progressive. He, he's not out to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. It makes sense, he's not a Jew. He's not out to prove that Jesus is God in the flesh. His purpose is to give us an, or, an orderly historical account. So in my mind, as we go through this, this is about as good of a historical chronology of the ministry of Christ as you're going to get. Okay? Now, the word gospel, when we, we talk about four gospels, there's the gospel of Mark, the gospel of uh, Matthew, sorry, Matthew, the gospel of Mark, the gospel of Luke, the gospel of John. What does the word gospel mean to us? I'm going to say to us because I'll come back and I'm going to explain the word gospel in a moment. But what does it mean to us? Good news. Good news, okay? And so that comes from the Greek word euangelion, okay, which is u meaning good. It doesn't sound good, but it is good. U, you know, good. Ang- ang- angelos, angel, okay, is really a messenger. Angelo- angelon, then, is a message, so a good message. But the word gospel, interestingly for us, actually comes from the Bretons. It comes out of the, the Druids and the Bretons in England. And so it comes from the word or two words, Godspell. That when Christianity was spreading up into the Bretons, because where Rome went, you know, the Christianity was able to go because of Rome, okay? And so as they went up there, and Christianity was presented, and the testimony of Christ was given, and people gave themselves over to Christ, their lives changed. Changed so much that the people who were living in the Fens and stuff like that looked at these others and they said, they must be under a God spell that there's they must this God must have put a spell over them okay and so over time then like goodbye literally is what God be with ye okay and so the B Y E is uh, B E okay with ye okay so God be with ye and so gospel literally is God spell and so in a sense Luke's writing something does that make sense that he's hoping will transform the lives of people if they know it. You need to know this is true. This is real. This is assured. And because it is, I think it's going to transform your life like it transformed my life. That's what Luke's saying. Remember, he was a doctor living in, anybody remember? Where did he join? Paul. Yay! I'm so glad you're here. You haven't gone to school yet. All right, Troas. Tro- Everybody say it together. Troas. Okay, I don't know if that was born. There are some people who want to say that he's actually from Antioch. I don't know where they get that other than tradition. It's not in the Bible, okay? But where I know is that he was in Troas, and then all of a sudden he joins Paul at that moment, okay? And so it changed his life, transformed his life, hearing about Jesus, and he now dedicated his life to something different. Now, if you were Luke... Okay, and you're writing this orderly account of the ministry, the gospel, the good news of how Messiah came into the world, how the Christ came into the world. Where would you start the account? I mean, you're going to write a book. I've got numerous books I want to write. I'm just not a writer. I can't figure out how I even want to start them. Does it make sense? I mean, one night I woke up and for two hours I started writing because I have one, the Prima Principle, that I wanted to write for almost 40 years. And so, um, and I started writing in the middle of the night, and I got to the end of it, and I went, that's so stupid. How, how lame is that, you know? I wouldn't read it. Anyways, so, um, so where you start is important, isn't it? I mean, John chose to start his book by saying what? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, you know? And so, where you start? So where does Luke choose to begin his account of the ministry of Jesus with Zacharias. With Zacharias seeing a vision because he believes it's important for us to have this, if you would, prologue of John and how that's going to apply and how it it, um, builds, if you would, the messianic nature of Jesus. So first he begins with the two individuals that God chose to use. I mean, think about this. 
God chose to use these two individuals to begin his messianic work on the earth. This is before, before he ever comes and talks to Mary. Before he ever comes and talks to Joseph. Does it make sense? God's going to begin his messianic work by coming to talk to this guy named Zacharias. So first we want to talk about Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, and then we're going to talk about another conversation that Zacharias has, and that's with Gabriel. Say again? Zacharias. Zacharias. Did you say Zechariah? Yeah, okay. So ESV has Zechariah. Zacharias. It, it, it's Max Nix. Same name. <laughs> you understood that, right? Yeah, yeah. Ah, Sir Good? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I got my little German section over here. You know, they're understanding me over here, and it's really good. Okay? All right. Um, so, what is the first thing we know about Zacharias and Elizabeth? They are, say again? That's not the first thing. The first thing we know is that they're of the line of Aaron. Read the notes. I mean, <laughs> come on, I gave you a cheat sheet. It's right there. <laughs> they're of the line of Aaron, okay? So, so the first thing is we're told is Zacharias is of the order of Abijah. Now, we're not going to go to Chronicles and look at the 24 orders, okay? But we're, we're given specific instructions way back in the Chronicles, okay? When David was a king, there were so many priests, okay, coming from the lineage of Aaron, that they broke it into 24 orders, okay? 18, I think, were from um, Eleazar. Six were from Ithamar, okay? You can go and check me out if I'm wrong. That's okay. I'm not claiming I, I got that one down pat, but I think it's right. And so, um, and so 24 orders, okay? And one of those orders was the order of Abijah, okay? Now, there's a whole lot of debate on when these guys would serve, okay? Um, now, there were also three main feasts that they would also all serve at as well, okay? So if you were a priest during those days, you would serve at the temple maximum of five or six times a year, five or six weeks a year, okay? You would have your two weeks of your order, then you would have the primary feasts, okay? And then there's a leap year, like this year is a Jewish leap year, okay? And so they have second Adar, okay, Adar 2. And so that adds four more weeks. And so there's really no going backwards trying to figure out how they actually disseminated who would serve at the temple during those weeks, okay? So there's potential for five or six weeks that you would do it. So we're told Zacharias was then of an order of Abijah. So he is a descendant of Aaron. Well, we kind of know that because he's a priest. But what's kind of interesting is then we're specifically told that Elizabeth is a daughter of Aaron as well. Again, details in the Bible are important. God put them there for a reason, okay? This guy is a pure Levite, okay? He married a Levite. He didn't marry outside the clan, if you would, the tribe, okay? So as a priest, that was very important. He was pure from that end, okay? Okay? So they're both Levitical, okay, from that nature. They're both of the line of Aaron. But the second thing we're told then is that they were righteous before God. Well, that kind of goes along with that idea that clearly Zacharias is understanding his, his place before God and wanting to, to live that, okay? Now, what's interesting about this is I don't read Zacharias declaring this to me. I don't see... Elizabeth declaring this to me. I see Luke, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, telling this to me. Does that make sense? This is a big deal. Because many of us like to claim our own righteousness. But it doesn't matter whether you think you're righteous. It only matters whether God declares you as righteous. Does that make sense? Okay. So the first thing we want to do is look at some Old Testament examples of this righteousness. So, again, if you've got your Bibles, let's get ready to go, okay? So let's go back to, to Genesis chapter 6. And so we want to briefly look at these, okay? And again, you'll know them um, as we go into them. Not a, not a big deal, okay? The first one is Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Why? Because we're told. What did he do? 
Noah walked with God. Noah was righteous. We're going to see that in the next verse. Noah was just. Noah was perfect. He was team. Uh, what's the word? Yeah, tamim. Okay. He was perfect before God. Why? Because he walked with God. Go to 7 verse 1. It says, Then Yahweh said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous, a Siddiq, before me in this generation. I have seen that you are righteous before me. So I want to build a case here as we come through this. Okay? They are righteous. They are perfect. in their walking before God because they are obeying God. Do you understand? They're doing things. Now, what I also want to submit to you is that they're doing things because they what? They feared God because of their faith. Do you understand? God told Noah to do something that was mind-boggling stupid. Okay? I mean, we, we wouldn't say that because it, it wasn't, right? But from man's perspective, right? For 120 years, potentially, I think it, it was 120 years, I think that's what the that statement makes, that the days of man are 120 years, okay? So I, I think, so whether I'm right or wrong or indifferent, I'm going to say it this way, okay? For 120, 120 years, he and his sons are building this massive boat, okay? Ark, uh, barge, really, if you would. That's one and a half football fields long, one and a half football fields, so the width of it. So take a, a football field and stretch it out half the size. Four stories. 120 years of building this thing. Make sense? So he worked, and his righteousness was appeared, but it was because of his what? Faith, okay? So then we go to, to, to Genesis 17, okay? Same concept, and we'll just see it here, but we know the rest of the story with Abraham. Genesis 17, 1. When Avram was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Avram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, I am Almighty God, Walk before me and be, what? Blameless. So he calls for Abram to be blameless. Now, we know that earlier that Yahweh said to him, look to the sky, right? Look, count the stars, if you can, right? And then we're told that Abraham, what? Believe God. Believe God, and then he counted it to him for righteousness. So even after God called him, and counted to him for righteousness, he still calls him to be what? Righteous, blameless. Make sense? And so, what do we know about Abraham? He comes into the land, right? He offers up a sacrifice, but then all of a sudden there's a what in the land? A famine. And what does he do? He goes to Egypt. What does he do? A half lie. Come on, Chuck. It was just a half lie. It wasn't a full lie. It's just a half lie because she really was his half sister. So it was just a half lie, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. He sells off his wife. And then he doesn't do it once, but then they come out. God de delivers them and they go to the, to the king of Gerar, Abimelech. And what does he do? He does it again. And yet God says he's a righteous man. Yeah, he, he's saving his own flesh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he's protecting himself. And so, but God still calls him righteous because Abram, Avram, who becomes Abraham, right? He what? He believes in God. Does he make mistakes? Does he mess up? He does. Sound familiar? Like, like, a, like our story, right? Faith precedes righteousness. Righteousness is a declaration that comes from Yahweh. So I want you to think of it because we're coming to Zacharias, right? So next one is Job, right? So Job 1, um, 1, I mean, you know the story. Again, Satan comes into the throne room, right? And Yahweh says to him, have you seen my servant? Job, there is what? There's none like this guy, okay? And so in Job 1, 1, we read his testimony, and I'll read it when I get there. Sometime today. 
There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. He was a righteous man. He was blameless and upright. Why? Because he feared God and shunned evil. They go together. Does it make sense? I mean, if you're fearing God, you're going to what? Shun evil. And if you were going through Proverbs every day, then Proverbs chapter 7, you saw the same thing. It was the same command coming through Proverbs 7 this morning, you know, to, to, to spend time in God's word uh, and then shun the, the harlot, shun the evil woman, okay? So, but in 9 2, this is really kind of interesting for me because Job turns around and says a very interesting statement. Then I'm going to start at verse 1. Then Job answered and said, Truly I know it is so, but how can a man be what? Righteous before God. As righteous as you may want to be in and of yourself, before God, you are what? You're unclean. You are not righteous. Okay? That leads us then to the New Testament teaching or the New Testament exhortation. In Romans 3, 9 to, 20, 9 to 25, we read about that there is none that what? Are righteous, no, not one. You can turn there with me if you would. Romans chapter 3. There is none who are righteous, no, not one. That's verse 10. But we're going to stick it, keep it in context, beginning at verse 9. Okay, beginning at verse 9. What then? Are we any better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Gentiles, Greeks, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that in every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That all the world what? May become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law... No flesh will be justified, be declared righteous, in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law in the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation of payment by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. God says there is not an individual on the earth who is righteous. They're not sinless. In fact, James chapter 2 verse 10 says, if you obey the whole law, and yet you stumble at one point, you are guilty of, of it all. So, of your own desires, you will never, ever, 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 you got that? I'm going to say ever, ever, forever, right? Ever seek God. You will never, ever, ever seek God on your own. Period. If God didn't come and draw you to himself, through the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, you would never, ever, 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 ever come. You will be condemned to yourself in your own desires. That's what he's saying. It just won't happen. So what did God do? God loves you. God wants you. God wants to have fellowship with you. So he sent Jesus Christ to be the propitiation, the payment for your sins, in order that you might be able to have not your own righteousness, which is like a what? Filthy rag. But rather that you might be able to have the righteousness of God. So here's the deal. There is one other way to get to heaven other than through acceptance of Jesus Christ as your Savior. I got your ears, right? What? Save it louder, Mark. 
live a perfect life. And the definition of perfect is as God. To be as perfect as God. It's impossible. It's not just hard, it's impossible. Because you were born in sin. Do you get it? If you've ever disobeyed your mom, this is what I love doing, it's a good news club, right? How many of you ever disobeyed your mom or your dad? Put up your hand and you're lying right now, so therefore you're already sinning, right? And the reality is, at that moment, you've done what? You've sinned. You've broken law. You can't get there on your own. It doesn't really matter. But God gives you then his righteousness, the righteousness of God that comes upon you. And so Titus 3, 3 to 7, says that that is the reason, that's the purpose why God sent Jesus to come. Okay, That he is the righteousness of God. And so those who believe him receive that righteousness as well. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that um, God sent him, who what? Knew no sin, to become our sin, in order that we might become his righteousness. Isn't that kind of cool? So, so I'm going to bring this all the way back now because we're talking about who? Zacharias and Elizabeth. Now, they weren't New Testament saints, were they? They were Old Testament saints. Jesus hadn't been born yet. Okay, kind of makes sense, right? So we're talking about some Old Testament saints that God declares as what? Righteous before him. So based upon just these couple verses of Scripture, and we could go to a whole lot more, what do we know about Zacharias? This is important as we move forward here. What do we know about Zacharias and, and um, his wife, Elizabeth? Say again? They're Levites, yes, but specifically they're righteous. So what does it mean to us that God declared them righteous? They love God, and they're seeking to obey his commands. They fear him. They love him. Do you understand? They're not playing a game. They're not like the Pharisees who come to their son later on, John, right? And John says, and you brood of vipers, you know, who sent you? You know, do, do fruits that are worthy of repentance, right? So God chooses these two, and he declares them as righteous. Now, the last thing that we know about them, which is potentially the first thing that people think about, and that is that they were childless. We're told that Elizabeth was barren, and she was well advanced in years. That's exactly what we're told about Sarah, okay, before Sarah gives birth, that she was well advanced in years, okay? And so she was beyond the time that she could have children, menopause, beyond it. Make sense? She's past those days. No, can't, can't have babies anymore. It, and all of a sudden, she's blessed. I tell you, from Marsha's and my perspective, we already, you know, Anna's perspective, she's not here. She, she has grandparents as parents, right? And <laughs> it's for real, for real. I mean, she gets it. I mean, and so I feel bad sometimes. I can't imagine Marsha getting pregnant right now. She is sick at home right now, and it's the morning. No, no, no. She was sick yesterday afternoon, too. Okay, don't go there. <laughs> I'm 63. I'd be 81. It's the way to keep your youth all the time. You start keeping having kids, you know. I can't imagine the joy <laughs> that, that Zacharias and Elizabeth have at this moment. Think about it. Because this next part is we're going to have this conversation between Zacharias and Gabriel, right? And first of all, we have this pronouncement, okay? We have this appearance of Gabriel. He comes in there, okay? And so you can imagine your Zacharias, and Zacharias is offering the, the incense in the temple. Everybody's waiting for him where? Outside. Outside, okay? I've got a lot that I could share on that, study that, a whole lot of that out, but I, it's not for right now, okay? But there's important when it comes to timing, and I don't want to go into timing of all this kind of stuff, of when potentially he was, he was there, okay? But this is a big deal. He's offering the incense in the veil, and everybody is waiting for him outside. Okay? There's only certain times that that probably is. Okay? We'll just leave that go. So he's back there. Everybody's waiting on him. He's, he's back in the Holy of Holies in that area, right? And he's offering incense. Now, they would wear, potentially tradition tells us, that they would have like bells and stuff that were on, on them so they could hear the, the priest jingling so they would know that everything's okay. And they would have a, a string that was on them so that if he dies, they can drag him out, right? So, you're, so become Zacharias right now. You're in the temple. Okay, you're, you're, you're going to go, you know the whole story of Nadab and Abihu and all this kind of stuff, right? 
Okay? And so there you are. You're going to offer the incense. And what happens? A little baby with, a, with wings on the back and a harp comes and says, Oh, hi, Zacharias. It's not what happened, is it? It's not what he saw. He saw a warrior. The question is whether, is Gabriel a, a cherub? Or is he a seraph? Or maybe is he something different? Okay? I mean, we're only told about cherubs and we're told about seraphs. The cherubs that we're told about have four different faces. And they have six wings. And some of them rode on, on uh, gyroscopes, you know? The seraphim were flaming fires. So I'm opting for a seraphim right now. <laughs> okay? And so you got whatever this angelic warrior looks like coming to him. What's your first reaction? Oops, I'm dead. <laughs> I don't know about you. That's me. I'm dead. <laughs> yeah. That bell stops ringing. People out there are what? Yeah, you're probably shaking a whole lot. Yeah, yeah. That's probably, you're probably right, Mark. But the people out there, they don't know what's going on. They're worrying what's going on. Make sense? And now you start having this conversation. Well, this guy starts off with this, this, this announcement. Your prayer is heard. Big deal. Because now what is he going to ask for? He's going to tell him. Your prayer is heard. Your wife is what? She's going to have a child. Zacharias for years has been praying for what? A son. Probably. A child. Probably a son. Someone to carry on his name. His name. That's going to become big later on when they go to name the child. Make sense? So he's been praying for this. But now here he is, Abraham, beyond what he could imagine that it's going to happen, right? Just joking, because he's going back to Abraham and Sarah, Zacharias, and, and thanks for calling me on it, Zacharias and, and Elizabeth, right? And now all of a sudden, when you think it's all gone, God's going to what? He's going to do it. He's going to do it. So, so he tells him, your prayer is heard. Your wife will bear you a son, and you will call him Yachanin. I know it says John, but the Hebrew word is Yachanan. It is Yahweh's favor, the favor of Yahweh. So Chanun, Chen is favor, and so Yehovah, Yahweh is Yahweh, right? So the favor of Yahweh, Yahweh's favor, Yahweh's grace, if you want to bring it over into, into our concepts, okay? And so you will call him John, and you will have great joy. Now, stop for a moment. Let me ask you, is, is this a good pronouncement or a bad pronouncement? It's a good pronouncement. Okay? So you may be nervous at first glance at this guy, but now you understand this is a messenger from God, and he's giving you a good, good message, yes? Good news, right? This is U and Galeon. He's a good angel with a good message. Yeah? This is good stuff. How would you respond? Would you be excited? Or would you doubt? Yeah, exactly right. Not Zacharias. Because now we get to the denouncements. Because Zacharias doubts it. How could you doubt it? God sent you an angel. And you're going to what? Call him on the carpet? How do I know this is true? Oh, God's going to send you another angel because you don't believe me. And so, who, which angel do you want to come see you? Michael? I'll send Michael. You, you want to you see another angel? Maybe the death angel. Anyways, no. <laughs> so he says, he says, no, I don't, I don't believe. So what happens? God chastens him through the angel. Now, I want you to get this. The angel pronounces the what? The judgment. The chastening. Isn't that kind of interesting? That kind of make you think for a moment, okay? So did he already know? Did God already say to him before he came, Gabriel, look, you're going to go down there, you're going to make this, you're going to tell him about this, but I'm warning you, this guy's a tough cookie. <laughs> he is not going to believe you, you know? He's, he's so over, he's, I know he's been praying about it, but he doesn't really believe I'm going to answer. Does it sound like anybody? You've been praying about it, but you really don't believe God's going to what? Answer. So he's been praying, but he doesn't think I'm going to answer. So he's going to doubt you. So here's what you do. When he doubts, kick him with muteness. <laughs> I want you to think about this one. His muteness 
isn't going to be just for him. His muteness is really for who? It's not for his wife. Yeah, it's for his wife. That's probably a woman who said that. Was that a woman who said that? <laughs> but it's for the people. Because now all of a sudden, this guy's going to be mute how long? Nine months. At least nine months, right? So until the, the baby is born. Now we assume that he goes back. They... Ah, good. No, I don't know that. But okay, nine months and one week. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so eight days after. That's good, Matthew. That's exactly right. No, that's right. So nine months and one week, okay? We don't know how long it took her to, to give birth, but yeah, so in the nine months ballpark, okay, this guy's going to be mute, and everybody's going to see it. And then the big day's going to come when we talk about this, when you go to name him, right? When all of a sudden his mouth is what? Okay. Opened up. This is like Ezekiel. Go back and read Ezekiel. God struck Ezekiel with muteness for 12 years, I think it was. Does anybody remember that off the top of your head? I think it was 12 years that, that Ezekiel was mute. And then God opened up his, his mouth. And again, it's a testimony to everybody else. It's certainly not to Ezekiel, because Ezekiel knew what was happening. And it wasn't to Zacharias, because clearly his wife got pregnant, and now he what? He believes, right? Okay? So, so, but God says no. Through Gabriel, Gabriel says, look, I'm Gabriel, man. I stand in the presence of God. <laughs> I don't know who you think you are. <laughs> but just so you know, so you know this is how it's going to play out, guess what? you're not going to talk back to me anymore. <laughs> In fact, you're not going to talk back to anyone for nine months until you see the fulfillment of your answer to prayer. To prove. Isn't that kind of cool? So God is good. So Zechariah's muteness, and then you've got the conception, Elizabeth's joy. Because now, all of a sudden, Elizabeth's going to give birth. And she is going to have such great joy. What a mixed bag, isn't it? I don't know how old she is, but if she's past menopause, there's, there's, there's this... But you know what's kind of cool about this? If God's going to do something, and he's going to grant you something, if I'm Zacharias or Elizabeth, what does this tell me right now? I'm living 18 more years. Because God's not having this baby be an orphan from the get-go. Does that make sense? They may not be thinking that way, but that's how I'm thinking right now. Uh, you know? I mean, God's granting me. You know, so, you know, do I want to have another baby right now? Oh, I don't know. But anyways, um, but that's what I'm thinking, okay? And so Elizabeth's got this great joy, great pleasure, one that she thought she would never, ever have. So, in the end, the questions. How have you responded to the message of God? Have you responded like Zacharias? Now you say, well, I've never had an angel come talk to me. Do you realize every time you pick this book up, you have the comb combination, the, the compilation, the compilation of 40 different men that God used over a period of 1,600 years to give you his message. That it's not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that are really the Gospels. But all the way from Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty. And it begins there is the good news. Because God begins to lay out a plan of redemption that he goes all the way to Revelation chapter 22 with. And even in the book of Revelation, which is all about future prophecy, it's not, but it is, God says right in the beginning, blessed are those who what? Read. Those who hear and keep the words of this prophecy. God declares that there's going to be a blessing upon those who take the time to read his message. And then what? Believe them. God says that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ever ask or think. And that eye has not seen nor ear heard nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who wait on him. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many dwelling places, mansions, whichever way you want to put it. If it weren't so, I would have told you. But now I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back and receive you unto myself, that where I am, 
there you may be also. And eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered the heart of man. What that's going to be like. So whatever you can picture, it's not it. It's better. Do you believe it? Do you believe the message of God given unto you? Or do we act like Zacharias? I don't know. I hear that too many times from people. I know God's word says that, but do you know what happens when you say that? You become it. <laughs> Figure that one out. When you say, but. Okay. <laughs> Go read Proverbs 12.1. If you, if you uh, reject instruction, God says you are, say it louder, stupid. stupid. I'm not allowed to call you stupid, but God, that's what God says. If, if, if we reject his instruction, then we are stupid, okay? So how have you responded? Do you believe that God can do great things? David, a few weeks ago, taught about the mighty God, that when the sun comes, he would be called the, the mighty God. And David asked, what are you going to ask God? What mighty thing are you going to ask God? Are you going to put something out there that only God can do? Zechariah and Elizabeth got to live something that what? That only God can do. And when God did it, Zechariah, he still couldn't believe it. Oh, no, God. Do you believe God can do great things through you? I promise you, looking back 40 years, over the 40 years, it is amazing to me to see what God has allowed to happen through Bob Corbin. And I don't mean that pridefully at all. Someone was just asking me, because, you know, again, some of you know, we had a, a woman um, email us back um, before family camp from Australia. She got saved listening to one of our podcasts, you know, on, on Audible. And they asked me, how does that make you feel? Well, how do you think it makes me feel? Boastful. Hey! No, humble. So humble. I mean, that somebody in Australia... You got a teeny weeny church in Augusta, Georgia. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you ask or think. You just have to, and I don't mean this pridefully, you just have to trust him. You have to be willing to lay it out there. Again, I remember when God was challenging me to do those prayer videos. Whether you watch them or you don't watch them, I, it doesn't matter to me. It really doesn't matter to me. But I know there's people who are. And what God challenged me with when I was balking at it, and he says, if even one person is, is affected by it, is it worth it? <sighs> okay, God. And then a year and a half later to get that, the, the email from John, um, who I still meet with every week. And the email says, the subject is, even if just one. And he says, I'm the one. Isn't that cool? Y'all, just, just do what God has asked you to do. He is able to do mighty things. You're not. You're not. But he is. But it's got to be according to his will. If you're asking for a five-story house with 500 rooms, that's probably not <laughs> according to his will. Are you tracking? But if you're asking things according to his will, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you ever ask or think. Do you believe that he can do great things then through you? Do you believe that God will chasten those whom he loves? Ooh, this is the other side of that. So if you are walking astray, if you're acting like Zacharias with doubt, God will what? He'll spank your butt. He'll chasten you. Because he what? he loves you. And so Hebrews chapter 12 says that if you are walking astray, you're walking in darkness, you're not walking according to the, the truth of God's word, and you're not experiencing chastisement. In Hebrews chapter 12, check me out. It says then you are an illegitimate person. You're not really his. So it's something to think about. It's something to be sober about. What I find, again, Phenomenal about this passage is God declares Zacharias and Elizabeth as righteous 
before him. And then he what? He chastens them because of his disbelief. Finally, is there a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you for desiring to use us. Lord, you don't have to. You, you, you could do all this on your own without using these worthless pieces of, of clay. But we're not worthless because you have made us in your image and likeness. Because you have breathed the breath of life into us. Because Jesus, you came and you died on the cross for us. And so, Lord, I know that you desire all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of your truth. That you've made every individual in this neighborhood, in this community, in this country, in this world, in your image and likeness. And you desire for them to truly know you. Give me the passion that you have. Help me to love my neighbor as you love them. Lord, help me to be holy, to be pure before you as you are holy. And then, Lord, give us privileges to be able to proclaim your name. And then as you give us those privileges, Lord, give us your power that your word would go forth in a mighty way and that we'd see many people come to believe in this good news and their lives to be transformed like they're under a God spell. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.